So in this lecture, we will talk about rigid body transformations. When we start from scratch, we want to talk about linear transformations. And we want to touch on the topic of symmetry. And I'm going to talk about a little how symmetry relates to these transformations. I don't assume you have any backgrounds, but uh, we, I'm assuming that you know a matrix, a vector. And I know a lot of you um, know about rotations in 2D and 3D. That background obviously will help us to build a better understanding. But I'm going to start from basic, and then we make it gradually formal. In today's lecture, we focus on rigid body transformations, which are a class of transformations that are very helpful for us in robotics. In the next lecture, we generalize them and also um, basically locate them in a bigger landscape that, uh, of methods that, that's called matrix Lie groups. So first, what is a linear transformation? So a linear transformation is any map that preserves two operations, vector addition and vector multiplication by a scalar. And these two are properties of vector spaces. If you have a map that acts on a vector space, that means it takes a vector, it gives you another vector. If you apply that map to the linear combination of any two vectors from that space, the linear combination means multiply them by a scalar and add them up, right? It will preserve that structure. Those maps are called linear. For example, if you have a map such as T acts on a vector such as A, You see here that if we multiply A by C, A is a vector, C is a scalar, and then apply the transformation, it's the same thing again as applying the transformation on A and then multiplying by the scalar. You get the same result. That's the property of a linear map. Or if you add two vectors, right, it will preserve this structure. It's the same thing as individually applying the transformation to these vectors and then adding them up. You can write them together as well, that if you apply to, say, alpha times A plus beta times B, it's the same as alpha times T of A plus beta times T of B. So this is called a linear combination. Alpha and beta are real numbers, A and B, some vectors, the dimension is not important, Rn. So what is interesting about linear maps? Do you find anything interesting here? or you find it boring. It might be boring, but you will, you will be pleased if any problem possesses this structure. It will make your life very easy. So this tra transformation, transformations that are linear, they fix the origin. It will not move the zero vector to another, vec another vector or another point. So if you pass zero, you will get zero. A map that the function or a map that takes, so when I say map, I mean a function, right? So a function that 
takes something and gives you the same um, argument, it's, fi it's fixing that value. It's called the fixed point of that function, right? So the transformation that is linear, it fixes the origin. This is very important. That means that when you apply this transformation to vectors, it won't shift the space. This is a property of linear maps, because if, let's say, alpha and beta are zero, right? Zero is part of the vector space, and it will give you zero again. So this is true for all linear transformations. Now, you can verify this quickly in Julia numerically. If you define a matrix, two vectors, A and B, a scalar, you can add them up then apply the transformation T, right, which is a two by two matrix. T here is a two by two matrix. Now linear maps, they don't have to be in form of a matrix, but you can have a matrix representation for a linear map, okay? Or you can do it individually and you get the same answer as expected. You could, I know this is very trivial, but you can consider this as a crash course on Julie as well. You see how easy it is to write the code. Now, unfortunately, I need to clear my writing when I move because It's a static on the screen, okay? It's not like my slides. So you can verify this numerically and you get the same answers whether you do your operation of linear combination before or after. Now what are the examples of linear transformations? Scaling, right? You get, a, you get an object, get a vector, Scale it, make it twice of the initial size. Is the scaling a continuous map or discrete? You can gradually scale something, right? With any factor that you want, is it, it is continuous. You can assume a linear number that is a, uh, controlling the scale of an object. Right, so it is a continuous map in that sense. Reflection, however, is discrete because you have an object, you assume a line, right, and you calculate the reflection with respect to this line, it will move the object to the other side of the axis of reflection, right? It is not a continuous movement. But nevertheless, is is a linear map. There are other examples as well. Rotation is one of the most important ones that we want to study. Rotations are linear maps. So if the linear map fixes the origin, is translation a linear map? It is? Does the translation fix the origin? So translation map means that it takes a vector x or a, right? It takes a vector x and then gives you x plus a, okay? So if you have zero, we'll map it to zero plus a. So it will actually shift the origin. Right, these are called linear varieties or affine transformations. They're parallel, right? They're very similar, but it is a parallel version of what you had before. So these are called affine maps that we will see. So the translation is not, we can intuitively relate to this idea that the translation is not a linear map. by the strict definition of the linear map, that need, it needs to preserve the linear combination, right? 
Now you can also check the math that if t is a translation, meaning it takes a vector and adds another vector, t. Well, we can check if t is applied to a plus b, you'll get a plus b plus t. But if you apply t to a and b separately and then get the results, you're actually adding a plus t plus b plus t. You get two times t here. So it fails to satisfy one of them. That's enough to disqualify the transformation to be a linear map. You can check the other one as well. In fact, it fails to satisfy both of them. So the translation is not a linear map because it does not satisfy these two properties. Now, is the identity matrix a linear map? This is the identity matrix. Let's say three by three. Is this a linear map? Yes, because if you can apply it, it satisfies all the properties we talked about. It fixes the origin as well. Okay. Question. Are there matrices that are not linear maps? Question. Are there matrices that are not linear maps. So a matrix is a linear map, right? Now it depends how much constraint you want to put there. It might not be an invertible matrix, right? But it is linear because a matrix is a mapping from one vector space to another. In general, if it's a rectangular matrix, right? The columns of the matrix, right, will span a vector space, but basically they'll span at least a subspace, right? That is a mapping from one vector space to another. So it is a linear map, okay? However, you, you don't need matrices to talk about linear maps. Matrices are very convenient. Is a very com are very convenient objects to talk about linear maps, and what, that's what we will do. So let's check the scaling. How can we, without any you know formal discussion, how can we come up with a scaling? transformation as a matrix. Here's an idea. Take a matrix S, S, 0, 0, right? S is some real number. Multiply this by any vector x, y. This will give you S times x, S times y, S, x, y. We could have different factor, a scale for x and y. So a scaling matrix looks like this. It is a diagonal matrix with some scaling factor. If you have off diagonal terms, it will cause shear, right? You can stretch objects. Okay, so you can visualize this. Again, just a warm up. You can code in Julia and test some examples. You define your matrix, you define your vector. You apply the transformation and it scales your vector to be twice as big as the, the red is twice as big as the um, blue one. A question, a philosophical question. Are we scaling the vector or are we scaling this entire space? Okay. 
in this case, I'm scaling the vector, right? But I could just make the scale of the entire plane to be half of what it was. That would make, that would make my vector to be fetch bigger, right? So this is, you can, the transformation can be passive and active. Active is in, that's what we do. We transform the object. But it's also very common to think about the transformation as a passive transformation. As if I'm rescaling the entire plane that these objects live on. Well, it depends if you want. Well, the question is, what would be the, an, ex an example of, let's say, using passive instead of active? It depends if you want to work with the inverse of that transformation or the transformation itself. It's very common in aerospace to work with the inverse of a rotation matrix, which we will see later as we move forward. That's basically modeling um, the problem in the frame that is attached to the airplane, aircraft. Basically, you assume you are the center of the world, right? Everything is rotating around you, which in a sense is true. That's how we operate. We don't care about the coordinates attached to a corner, right? The way I see the world, I am the center, and everything is relative to me. So it makes sense. That's how you can imagine a bird is probably perceiving as, as it's flying. So it's very reasonable to do that. I use the direct, you know, the, the active version, and it's very common in robotics to use the rotation itself relative to a fixed or inertial coordinate frame. It's a little it's matter of taste how you prefer, but sometimes it does matter. Because if you want to build a map, for example, to be a global map, probably you want to build that map with respect to some origin, fixed coordinates, right? But maybe you want to make a robot-centric map, a region around the robot as the vehicle is moving. You just want to track that part of the map. You don't want to map the whole world. You just care about maybe 20 meters around the vehicle. And that's very reasonable for a lot of applications. And it's very efficient. Does, does it ever happen that uh, you want to, let's say, like, if you have a moving robot with an detector, Uh, active transformations, but, uh, but for the robot itself, it's position Your question, I'm trying to understand. You're asking if I have a robot manipul manipulator and then I have a frame attached to the end effector and there's a base frame. That was a good example. If you have a robot arm, the robot is moving, you want to open the door, do you care to have the relative uh, pose of the handle or the doorknob with respect to the arm wrist or with respect to some fixed inertial frame for the manipulator? Probably in the arm wrist, right? But everything is possible. These are just a change of coordinates and transformation, as we will see. It's a body frame, inertial frame, and you can go back and forth. So it's a choice that we can make. And in an ideal case, we can go back and forth. There's no problem. Yeah, thank you. Aerospace. Um, Folks, don't like me. I, <laughs> I'm changing the convention, so. So 
So the scale is one form of transformation. You can apply to a vector. It will give you another vector. Rotation. I can do the same operation using a matrix. I'm defining a 2D rotation matrix here using the familiar equation that I trust you've seen it before. Cosine of theta minus sine of theta. And the second row. So I take a vector, the blue vector. The rotation acts on this vector v, or I'm applying the rotation matrix to this vector v. I get another vector u, and it is rotated. And I'm rotating it by 45 degrees, OK? 45 degrees counterclockwise, right? So the rotation is around the z-axis pointing up. If you rotate it with a negative of this angle, obviously it goes down, right? It rotates, it rotates clockwise. We go through it, but you already know that the inverse of this rotation is the negative of that angle, right? It's the rotation that will cancel it if you apply it again. So this is also a linear map. Um, I know you see sine and cosine, but it doesn't matter. When you evaluate it for a particular angle, you just have a matrix of uh, numeric values. So it is a matrix. It's a linear map, right? So it is not a good idea to write this sine and cosine, multiply it by a you know, symbolic vector, and then call it a nonlinear function. That's not a correct way to look at it. When you think about it as a linear map, as a matrix, now it is a linear map. A matrix is an appropriate tool to look at it. When you put it in a matrix, it is a linear map. Why you see sine and cosine, we'll see in a bit. So if you multiply the rotation by vector, the first row obviously gets multiplied by the vector as a column. Or the, another way you can think about matrix vector multiplication is that you get weighted sum of the matrix columns using your vector's coordinates. Okay. This is the second way of multiplying matrix, mat matrices, in particular matrix and vector. You can see it from here, right? You can just separate them and then factor V1 and factor V2. So this is essentially multiply V1 by the first column and then plus V2 by the second column. This will give you the same result. What is interesting about it is that as if the, these are some new basis vector, right? Intuitively, you can think about these two new vectors that are now using sine and cosine as two new basis vectors. Can we derive the rotation matrix using this idea? And that's, that's what we're going to do. So let's dive into the rotation. So the rotation is a circular movement of an object. You can see there's a sphere here. There's an axis. You can rotate about that axis. How many number of rotations do we have, let's say, for this sphere, a 3D object? Infinite. Why infinite? 
Yeah. It can be any number, right? You might choose an arbitrary angle or axis for your rotation, and that can basically constitute infinite number of configurations for this object to rotate in the space. So it is a continuum. It's, it's a continuous way of moving object. Um, but it is also a particular way of moving the object. It's, all, it's only rotating it. All right, let's drive the 2D rotation matrix. I don't know if this is how you learned it, but this is a good way to derive the 2D rotation matrix. Suppose we have the 2D plane. We work with our standard basis, E1 and E2, for R2. These are the standard basis of R2. The code is just reproducing the plots I'm using. Now, imagine I take the, these two standard bases, the blue axis, I'm going to rotate it together, with, together as a rigid object. I'm not changing the, the perpendicular nature, right? Together I'm rotating them to become these red vectors. And then let's call them E1 prime and E2 prime. So E1 prime and E2 prime are rotated by an angle of theta. Okay. Now what is the linear map that will send the blue set of vectors to the red set of vectors? That sounds like to be a rotation matrix. So we want to find what does it look like. So one way to think about this problem is that write down the coordinates of the transformed red axis in terms of the original, the fixed axis. And by that I mean what is the coordinates of this vector with, its, with respect to the initial horizontal and vertical axis, right? Now these are unit vectors, so there is no length. So all we need to do is think about the projection, right? It's, which is a cosine and sine of theta for E1 prime. For the second one, it ends up being because this angle is theta, right? So the first one is negative of sine of theta. The second one is cosine of theta. So we got E1 prime and E2 prime in terms of that initial coordinates frame. These are also called direction cosine vectors, okay? Because all you do, you take the projection using trig, and then you find out the coordinates of the transformed um, orthogonal or orthonormal frame. Now, the trick is now, you, we need to ask the question that if I have a vector v, and v is written in terms of the red coordinates, E1 prime and E2 prime, what is the equivalent of that vector, let's call it V prime, in terms of the blue coordinates? Obviously V1 prime and V2 prime, they cannot be the same thing, right? Because I'm using a different set of bases. To hold this equality, and I know it's the same vector, right? The vector is the same in the plane. I am just changing the frame that I'm ob observing that vector, right? There's got to be some relationship that helps me to relate these two observers together. And that is my rotation matrix. 
because the vector is fixed in the plane, and I am not changing that. I just want to observe it from different frames. So you imagine two people, right, looking at an object. You say it's one meter away. Your friend says it's two meters away. And maybe there's a relationship between you and your friend, right? So that's the observer frame or frame of reference. Now, you, when you, we use this property that these two must be equal, what we learn is that we just substitute E1 prime and E2 prime, right, and expand it. We learn that this relationship basically is captured by what you see here. So V1 prime is V1 times cosine of theta minus V2 times sine of theta. Similarly, you have an expression for V2 prime. Now, let's rearrange it in a matrix that is multiplied by our vector V1 and V2, right? What's left is the rotation matrix. So that's how you can prove that indeed the 2D rotation matrix admits this representation as a way of changing your observing frame for an object that lives in the plane and is not basically moving, right? So we get our rotation matrix. Now this way of, you might know this from linear systems course, that this way of mixing um, basically a system's response across different bases, right, and adding them up is a property of linear systems. If they're not linear, you can't do that because the outcome won't be as simple as the same linear combination. This is called superposition, and it's a property of linear maps. Okay, so... Can we call this change of basis? It is for your vector, right? But change of basis for a matrix is different. Because you might express your matrix transformation in one reference frame, and then you want to change it in another reference frame, right? For example, you have a camera, you observe an object, and maybe you have a LiDAR on the robot and you want to see the object in the, frame, in the reference frame of the LiDAR. So you need to know the relative transformation between your camera and LiDAR, and then do a change of coordinates to um, <clears throat> basically get that object. Now, if that object, I mean in a mathematical sense, is a matrix, the change of reference, it looks like a conjugation, it's not just a matrix vector multiplication, right? But for your vector, it will do it. We'll see in Lee Group lecture that um, the adjoint map will do the change of basis for you. By the way, that motivates the calibration, right? You, because you might want to relate different observations and, or combine them for a state estimation in one common frame, you do need calibration between different sensors on the robot. In an ideal setup, we, we might assume they're co-located, right? But they must certainly not because they're physical objects, right? Maybe the IMU is here, maybe the camera is here. That might cause some error in your estimation if you do not count for that, okay? I think we talked about right hand rule right later, but you know that already. Your thumb is a, a, along the axis of rotation, right? And when you bend your fingers, assuming you all can bend it like me, this is how you rotate. Right, use right hand, right? Don't use left hand, that will change the convention. That's the positive direction. Let's talk about circle group. 
what is common between that 2D rotation matrix and the circle? Asking the question in a better way, what is the set of transformations that when you apply it to this circle, it will leave it unchanged? And by that, I mean you close your eyes, I transform this circle somehow, you open your eyes, you think nothing has changed. You will not recognize any changes, right? What is the set of all transformations that lead to that behavior? Multiples of 360 degrees. 360 degrees. What if, so you, your guess is 360. What if I rotate it five degrees? Will you notice? On this particular circle, you don't. If I have, let's say, I put a landmark here, you're right, right? This object, you will notice, because if I rotate it 60 degrees, the, this will move here. But I'm talking about the smooth circle, there is no diff, nif difference at different points, right? So it's, it's a circle like this. This, ignore all the, all the numbers and red and blue drawings. I'm going to change that a little bit. You're saying that the transformation should not scale because if the circle becomes bigger or smaller, you will notice, right? So one condition on the transformation or one constraint on the transformation that we definitely want is that it should not scale. Not making it smaller, not making it bigger. Preserve the distance between any two points. And that is called a rigid transformation. Okay, which we will see it leads to the determinant of the rotation matrix being one. Don't scale it, don't re reshape, don't deform the object. So don't deform, don't scale. So we know that the scaling, although it's a linear transformation, is not part of that group that we're talking about. So any rotation will give us the, the answer, right? Rotation about the center of this circle. If you close your eyes, no matter what's the angle, amount of rotation, I can rotate the circle, you open your eyes, you won't notice, it's just the same circle. It leaves the space unchanged. Now, this is the same thing as a 2D plane, right? A 2D plane or just a real line, right? Real line is infinite. It goes from negative infinity to positive infinity. If you close your eyes and I shift this line one unit with whatever um, basically metric forward or backward, you won't notice because it's infinite, right? It's like a wallpaper pattern. In a sense, that's also a symmetry of that space because it leaves the space unchanged. So we say that 2D rotations are forming this, they form the symmetry group of the circle, right? These are continuous symmetry of the circle because when you rotate the circle, you get the same shape. They are identical. This is the concept of symmetry in math and it's heavily used in physics. Now, Lie groups are the best mathematical way we have to describe continuous symmetries. That's why we're interested in studying them. That's why in physics they use them, okay? So at, at this point, it's the best tool we have in mathematics to study continuous symmetries of different spaces. What about sphere? This is 2D, let's make it 3D. What about a sphere? 
If it's a smooth, you know, no color, no pattern, just a uniform sphere in 3D, you can rotate it in 3D in any way around the center of that sphere, right? So the 3D rotation group will form the symmetry group of that sphere. Again, because the test is close your eyes, you apply any of the transformation from that symmetry group, you open your eyes, you will not know. Nothing has changed. So that's why these matrix groups or Lie groups are very important because they capture very fundamental structure about the geometry that we use them for manipulating uh, coordinate frames and moving objects. And in robotics, it just pops up naturally because you have joints, arms, articulation, different sensors. You're modeling the geometry to build map or estimating the trajectory. So it's a very natural tool to use. And as we go forward, hopefully you get a feeling how it's connected to maybe other methods that you've seen. Now for circles, one interesting observation is that if you know a little about complex numbers, a unit circle is basically a group of all unit complex numbers, right? The complex number is x plus i y. If all of them have magnitude of one, that forms a circle. Why? Because this, this is the equation for the circle, right? Now, you know the Euler identity. I shared a proof this morning with you in case you want to know where it comes from. It's very easy to prove. But the exponential of i times theta equals cosine of theta plus i sine of theta. In a complex plane, you can imagine this is actually modeling all the points on this circle, right? In the complex plane for you. Now, what is interesting is that this is equivalent of our 2D rotation matrix. This is no different. You just, if you choose to work with complex numbers, unit complex numbers, right? It acts as rotating your vectors when you multiply it. But we, we used to using 2D rotation matrices. Very important observation here is that adding angles that we see here so adding these angles corresponds to multiplying two consecutive rotations. Is this by chance? Is this, are we up to something? And absolutely, this is what we're going to generalize. You have an angle and you can do algebra. There is an exponentiation, you get to multiply. There's a one-to-one -one correspondences here. When we generalize this to higher dimensions, then we're gonna talk about tangent spaces and Lie algebras because maybe it's just not, it's not just one angle, maybe it's in 3D. Maybe you need three angles for rotation in 3D. Then you see that when we add these angles in a vector space that we're gonna name it Lie algebra, it will correspond to multiplying rotation matrices in some space of rotation matrices that will be three by three, okay? So this observation holds in higher dimensions. Now in this case, 
the order is not important, we will see the order becomes important when we go to higher dimensions. Because this is a scalar, it's not a matrix. Matrices are not commutative. You can't just change the order the way you want. We need to follow some more rules. But this, this is very important because it doesn't matter how you choose to work with the rotation, whether you want to use unit circle or 2D rotations, these are equivalent. And the fact that we can do algebra instead of multiplying here scalars, but later matrices, it's very important, again, because when we can do algebra, usually we can solve the problems much more efficiently. We are good at doing algebra, whereas working with perhaps geometry will require a lot more knowledge. It will be harder, okay? So on the surface, some of the tools we use, it might look difficult, but actually it is a simple way of running the calculations because we use linear algebra. We reduce the geometry to algebra. So that's the takeaway from here. And remember the exponential map. This is for a scalar. Later, we will have matrix exponential, analogous to what you see here for exponentiation. Now, 3D rotations. You probably know this. You can name it roll, pitch, yaw, right? How can we drive this? Roll is usually forward-looking axis, right? Pitch is um, basically bending forward and backward, and yaw is usually along, along the ver about the vertical axis. Or in aerospace, it's very common to work with downward basically z-axis, it's also very common in computer vision. For camera, we usually assume the z-axis is pointing, no, we actually assume z-axis is pointing towards the lens of the camera. So you might see different conventions and different setup, but that's not a concern. We can always map any setup to um, the setup that we want to work with. Now, how to derive the 3D vector? Can we do what we did for the 2D case in this case? And the answer is yes, you can assume that we have our standard basis for R3 and you have an orthonormal frame. Let's say we want to rotate it about the third axis. So when you rotate about an axis, it will leave the axis unchanged. We can all relate to that. So the third axis won't change because That's what will happen, right? In plane, you're just rotating the other two axes. And we write down, as before, the condition that if I have a vector, and it must, uh, in, in the new, basically, according to the new set of bases, if it takes this form, what is its equivalent using the old basis? Then you can solve for it, then you can arrange it in a matrix, and that will give you the matri rotation matrix about the z-axis. Again, the columns are called direction cosine uh, vectors as well. So that's one way a lot of books will start from there and tell you, arrange the direction cosine mat uh, vectors, and that will give you a matrix, that's called a rotation matrix. But this, is, this is starts a little before that. It gives you a, lot, a little more information where it comes from. Now, your exercise is to prove for y and x using the same process. So these are familiar rotation matrices about x, y, z, right? It's in a sense, it's, it's trivial to derive 
If you don't remember, you can just drive it. Or you can Google. So affine transformations. What is linear? What is affine? And a fine transformation is a combination of a linear transformation and a translation. So although translation is very linear map, but they're very important. We care about translation as a map a lot because that's how objects move, okay? So we, we, the objects in general can rotate and move, and that can happen at the same time. So the general form is that Apply a linear map plus a translation. This is called the affine transformation of a point or a vector. Now, you can have many types of affine transformations because you can have many types of linear transformations. But of particular importance for us is a class of Rotation and translation, uh, basically using any real vector. These are rigid body transformations. Rigid because they preserve the distance between any two points on, on the object. Which is what you expect, right? If you want to come up with a model that describes this motion, you already know that there's nothing different about this object at this point in the space or this point. So this model will respect that structure. Um, so this example, is he a constant? Or is it like t times? No, t is, is a three vector. t is like x1, x2, x3. Or t1. Now your question is, if it is, it is constant, well it can be, if it's the transformation that is given, it's constant. In general, it can be any number, right? Maybe it's given and you want to transform a point, maybe the po a set of points is given and we want to find a transformation, so it depends. In point cloud registration topic, that's the problem. I have two set of points. I want to find this linear map, this affine transformation that aligns these two point clouds. How can I do that, right? Then we're going to see how we can formulate an optimization to solve for that. So if I have a pyramid or any other objects, this is an example, and I rotated about the x-axis and then translated using now this constant translation vector, what I will get is that it is rotated and then translated. So the rotation is for 45 degrees and the translation is using t. Now, question. Will you get the same answer if instead of R X plus T, first we translate and then we rotate? You're saying no. Somebody says yes. Stand up and leave the room. <laughs> well, a very quick Let's say you hate intuition and visualization. You just say, well, this is not the same, right? You don't have to think about it. And that's perfectly fine. But let's, let's see. You, get, you have this pen, right? How is the trans? The translation is, in this case, is saying to move forward in this direction, 0.5, in this direction, 0.75 and 1. 
Now, the problem is when you rotate, right, this frame is rotating. And now you move in another direction. Whereas if you move and rotate, you end up at a different place. You might say, well, but I meant keep the frame fixed, right? But the way this transformation works, it works with the frame that is attached to the body, right? This model does not work with some fixed frame that you want to keep it fixed. You can't do that, but the way this transformation works, it will rotate the body, and then it will move the body. So rotating and translating is not the same as translating and then rotating. And it took 20 years to fix this in robotics. <laughs> so which is the standard for our field? Which one we should do? Yeah. When we will define the SE3 uh, group, you don't need to track this. It will rotate and translate. It will rotate first and translate. So because the affine transformation is defined this way, a, rot a rotation and then a translation. So in the context of invariant Kalman filtering, we will see that the way you define the error, it will change everything in the derivation of the filter. If you don't, res if you, if you don't respect this structure, you lose a very nice property that can render some problems linear in some coordinates. Whereas if you respect the fact that rotation and translation um, basically are uh, the order matters in rotation and translation, then for a certain class of problem, you can still have a filter that behaves like a linear Kalman filter, right? That's basically what we will, we will talk about in Kalman, invariant Kalman filtering. We need to build some more knowledge on the matrix group and then you will see why. The definition of the error will lead to that property. So this is very important. So this is a good way to end this part. Now, if you meet somebody, you want to tell the person how you make money, this is how you want to tell your story, not the ad, again. <laughs> Ads are, are, are not supported by me. I am not making money out of these ads. It's a good way to show others how you make a living. So what's, what's going on here? There's a legged robot, Cassie. There are a bunch of sensors. You see what the robot is seeing. The image that you see, it's a video recorded on the robot. It's shaking a lot because the robot is walking. And there's a LiDAR. What you see is the LiDAR point cloud accumulated for about maybe 10 seconds. Now, the LiDAR is spinning. 10 times in one second, the LiDAR is spinning. And the robot is also moving. So to see a consistent map of this building, a staircase, for example, that you're looking at, we need to know how the robot is moving in the space. So we not only compensate these 10 times per second packets that we get into one point cloud, but also we bring all the point clouds into a common frame. Otherwise, the first one, you see the table is here, you move, and then the next one, the table is moved as well. Because you're, you always observe the world in your sensor frame, whereas the map needs a common frame. So that 
when we do trajectory estimation, we can compensate that motion and then reconstruct the environment. And the way it works, it's basically a rigid body transformation, right? We track the rotation and translation of the robot, and we get this map. So you can do a lot of interesting things with rigid bodies. Yeah? Let's see. It's intensity, probably, because, so the question is, what is the uh, color map? It, now, you can choose the color map when we, you visualize, usually. Sometimes we use height. But you can see now, the ground is red. but the ground is also green, right? So it's not height. So I think it's the intensity. The LIDAR on top of a range that is with respect to other sensors like the steering camera is very accurate. Maybe five centimeters or 10 centimeters noise you get. On top of the range, it will return a metric intensity between zero and one, usually, that is a measure of the reflectivity of the material. If the material is shiny, the intensity value will be higher. If it's dark, it's most likely will absorb the light, the infrared, basically, uh, beam that the light is shooting. Then you get less intensity. And this is usually negatively correlated with, what the intensity, with the intensity that you get from camera image. So the camera is a passive sensor. It, it's not shooting any beam to observe the scene. A LiDAR is active. It shoots a beam, use the time of flight, right, for the light to measure how long did it take for the beam to go and come back. And then you can, the speed of light is constant and then you calculate the range. You're not sure the speed of light <laughs> is constant? <laughs> it's constant here on Earth. <laughs> There's also something uh, further up in the video where someone was walking along the shore bus and... Good point. It, it seemed like it was tracking that person as if it was a continuous obstacle. Yeah, I think so. I think so. Yeah. Good point. I wanted to talk about this part, but I forgot. So part of the video, you see somebody walks, right, in front of the robot. Because we just observe a snapshot of the world, the scene, and then accumulate them, we get accumulated traces of dynamic objects in the map. If this is a highly dynamic scene, the map will be cluttered with these, um, basically, traces. But the problem is, if the map is static, you think that's an obstacle, whereas it's not, because the object is moved. It will limit the capability of the robot to plan and operate in that environment significantly if the environment is highly dynamic. So that is a challenge, and it's a problem if your mapping algorithm is assuming the world is static. And that motivates the problem of dynamic mapping. Build a map that can handle dynamic situation, which is one of the good research topics that a lot of people work on. It. But that because of this. Yeah? Map with kind of that was part of the that was part of the they used the occupancy grid. Occupancy grid map, right? That they use. I mean, they update usually are able to filter out dynamic obstacles. Is there a like a version of the occupancy grid that extends to like more 3D 
structure like this? There is. And I will show that in the mapping lecture <laughs> coming up in the future. <laughs> so the question was that uh, some people did improve, right? It's not something that people didn't know. Obviously, they run the map on the robot. Maybe they tune some parameters to be a little robust to it by, you know, if you re -observe, by, by re-observing the same area to be more tolerant to that situation. The question was, is there any algorithm for 3D? And there are some. And we worked on one algorithm, and we are building more. And I've seen a couple of more publications came out in the past few years they are doing that. So I'll try to give an overview of those algorithms in the mapping lecture. But remember this, this is the motivation. You, leave tr you see these traces of dynamic objects if you assume the world is a static. Okay, so let's switch to Switch to, to the slides. All right, so rigid body, mo uh, rigid body motion. Rigid motion of an object, we, we just talked about it. It preserves the distance between any two points on that object. The study of robot kinematics and dynamics and control, typically, it's tightly integrated with this topic. It's so important that a lot of methods in kinematics, dynamics, and control are just purely based on geometry, understanding uh, the behavior of objects, the way they move. Now, you have an idea of what is a rigid object, but if you want to give it a formal definition, you can think about, as, think about it as a collection of, uh, basically, of particles such that the, di the distance between any two particles remains fixed. You can take this as a definition. And that's regardless of any external forces or how the object is moving. We also know that the rigid motion is a continuous movement because we can continuously rotate and translate. It can be infinitely small or large. Although rotation will look back, right? If you rotate 360, you come back to the same place. But obviously you can do many rounds. In that sense, you can have infinite rotation. So we, we're we going to think about two reference frames. One is called the inertial frame. The inertial frame is a frame that is fixed, or you can call it Spatial frame, this is fixed. And then you have a body frame. The body frame is attached to the object. It is moving with the object. This is moving. Now, if a frame is called A and is fixed, if a frame is moving, it's called B. If we attach coordinate frames to B, 
these points A and B. In the same way we derived the rotation matrices, if you construct this direction cosine matrix, this will give you the rotation matrix that relates frame B, moving frame, to frame A. In a sense, it describes the movement, the rotational movement of frame B relative to frame A. Because it changes based on the angle as it moves, it describes basically the motion continuously. This is called the rotational motion in R3. Now, as a summary again, the familiar rotation matrices are rotation about X, Y, and Z axis. Typically, you can combine them using some convention. These are called Euler angles. You have how many? 24? A lot of combinations of them. Because you can have Z, Y, X. You can have X, Y, Z. You can have Z, Y, Z. X, Y, X. I'm not a fan, and I don't use it, but this is very common to choose one of them and then work with them. Now, Z, Y, X is very standard to use. And the way it works is that you multiply R, Z, R, Y, and R, X. And that gives you a new rotation matrix that describes all three rotations at the same time. So you have rotation about Z, we call it yaw. You have rotation about the y-axis, we call it pitch, and you have rho. So three independent rotation, and you can combine them to get a bigger matrix. And you can imagine how nasty it will become after multiplying these three matrices, lots of sine and cosine. Now you do that, and at a particular angle, beta equals pi over 2, you get a gimbal lock. What happens is that your yaw and rho corresponds to the same rotation. It's a singularity because it doesn't matter as long as this, whichever you change, right, it changes the matrix in the same way. And that's the problem. And you can't fix it. Now you can change the coordinates, but then you just move the singularity to a different point. But it's always there, right? So there's no way you can fix this with coordinates. This is a topological problem of this space. Now the gimbal lock, is this a real problem? Yes, it is. You go to Wikipedia, you can read about it. In Apollo 11 mission, it happened, the moon landing mission. You can read the history. They had redundancy to basically control this, but they decided not to add the fourth gimbal to basically reduce some weight. That's the history you can read. But it happened. Instead of giving the warning at uh, 85 degrees, it gave warning at 70 degrees, it locked the system, they had to do something manually, as we read here. So it happened in the real world. There's some gimbal jokes, you can read about it. And laugh in your private setting. But I'm, what I'm gonna tell you, I'm gonna tell you what's the topological problem. Now, the problem in a simple word is that you have an axis of rotation, right? And you have an angle of rotation. Whatever axis you choose, E, if you rotate for 180, 
right? Pi. Then it doesn't matter if the axis is, let's say, E or negative of E. Because if you rotate 180, I can't show it with my hand, it's the same thing as you change the axis and do 180 from the other direction. Both of them correspond to the same rotation. So the fact that the representation is not unique, it causes this problem. So there is a particular orientation that is not unique. When you choose the coordinates like Euler angles, it shows up in terms of that singularity. At particular angle, then you lose degree of freedom. You cannot control the system, right? Because your roll and yaw are doing the same thing. You're not able to control the system. That can be very dangerous if you are dealing with safety critical systems. So mathematically, this is the reason. We're not going to fix it. It's just that's how it is. The space of 3D rotations, this is how it is. Now, however, you can, you can use unit quaternions for every rotation matrix. There is a plus minus unit quaternion. So the quaternions don't have this problem but still you have plus minus. So you have two for each rotation. As we will see in the context of Lie algebra, the Lie algebra of quaternions is the same as rotation matrices. So they are very similar in that sense. But if you work with quaternions, they don't have this um, singularity problem. That's why they are used in most of the state of the art state estimator, especially in aerospace industry. So you get quaternion Kalman filter. Usually when you buy an IMU, it comes with an orientation estimator that runs a quaternion Kalman filter. And quaternions are generalization. I, I, I told you about this complex number. Quaternions are basically generalization of 2D complex numbers to a four-dimensional space. Just like this had to be unit, right? This, had, this needs to be a unit quaternion. Otherwise, it's not a rotation, OK? Obviously, it will scale. It is a little scary how this IJK corresponds to 3D rotation, but that's how it is. <laughs> so we're going to work with 3D matrices. I think they are more approachable, but you're welcome to use quaternions too. So the property of rotation matrix is that because it's constructed using the uh, basically projection onto the fixed frame. It's a direction cosine matrix. And both coordinate frames are basically orthonormal. The axes are orthogonal. And each axis is also normalized. So the property of orthogonal matrix is that It is, its inverse is its transpose. So because of that, that's just from linear algebra, that the inverse of R will be its transpose, okay? Because it's an orthogonal matrix. 
And you can verify that whatever rotation you pick, make its transpose, multiply them, you'll get the identity matrix. Now we also know that the inverse of a matrix commutes with the matrix itself, always. And it is unique. Now take the determinant from both sides. which is the determinant of the product, right? The determinant of the transpose of a matrix is the same as the determinant of the matrix itself, and the determinant of the identity matrix is one. So we learned that the determinant of the square of R equals one, therefore, the determinant of the rotation, the matrix that is formed this way can be plus minus one. Now, out of these two choices, the next lecture we'll talk about it more, plus one is rotation, minus one is reflection, okay? Because it, now if this determinant is the volume that your matrix spans, right? It's the volume of the vector space. It's the volume of the subspace spanned by the columns of your matrix. That's the determinant. If it's not one, you're scaling. Obviously, we don't want that. Now, if the determinant is negative one, you're mirroring that volume. That corresponds to the reflection. More on this next time. So you can give, give them a name. Sounds like these are very important. They have some important constraints. Let's give them a name. The name we use is called SO3. We'll see why later, but they, call, they are called special orthogonal group of dimension three because these are three by three matrices. Therefore, R3. These are all invertible. This general linear means they're invertible. They, these are invertible matrices such that their inverses are their transpose, right? And the determinant is one. So every configuration of a rigid body that is freely rotating can be identified using a unique rotation matrix, okay? Now, to avoid the confusion, this rotation matrix when is three by three, there's no singularity here. It is when you choose the coordinates to model all of them, right? Because you can think about, for every configuration, there is a matrix that has nine numbers, right? That is perfectly fine. Is there any concept of depth Oh, a matrix is invertible if its determinant is not zero. We say a matrix is, we say A inverse exists if and only if its determinant is not zero. All the columns are linearly independent. Because the inverse formula has one over determinant, right? I'll talk about the general linear group next time as well. But it means all the square matrices that are invertible of a particular size. So we want to work with nice objects, not singularities. Yes, uh, you're right, this should be three. Now, how do you combine these matrices? 
Well, it turns out to get the rotation of frame C relative to B, we know how to construct that, right? Using the direction cosine matrix, or the method we learned how to derive it, you can have another matrix that is the orientation of frame B relative to A. To combine them, you can multiply them, right? So the common frame that is in the middle basically goes away. Then you get the rotation of frame C relative to frame A. Now you might ask, why don't you add them, right? Maybe there is something in your mind that wants you to add them. But the problem is when you add them, the result might not be a valid rotation matrix. That group, that we will formalize the idea of group next time, this group is not closed under addition. If you add two rotation matrices, then the result might not be part of this group. Therefore, it won't be a valid rotation matrix. But as long as you multiply them, you're always inside this group. It is closed under matrix multiplication. So that's the reason we don't add rotation matrices, because the result can be a wrong matrix. You can, of course, prove this, right? Derive B relative to C, derive a B relative, a C relative to B, derive B relative to A, multiply them, but also derive directly C relative to A. If you get the same answer, then that's the proof. You need to multiply them. Rotation about the same axis commute, just like the rotation in plane. Right, the 2D rotation. If it's about the same axis, the order uh, basically is not important. You can change the order. In general, that's not true because the matrix multiplication is non-commutative. That means two matrices commute if A times B equals B times A, right? But we know that in general, this is just not true for matrices. So you can't do that. So don't change the order in general unless you are confident that this is about the same ax axis and it's a very particular situation that you're doing calculation. Also, don't add them. Okay, we now talk about a generalization of that to rigid body motion, meaning we want to rotate, but we also want to translate. So the complete rigid motion is, is described by rotation and a translation. We ca we're calling it G here. So this object, this frame, they are no longer co-located, right? It rotates and moves away from the fixed frame. This was our fixed frame or inertial frame. This was the body frame. Which is that, that, that's how it is, right? Maybe the robot that starts from here, this is your zero, zero, zero for the map, right? The origin. And then the, as the sensor is moving on the robot, that's the body frame, it's moving. And localization problem is basically finding these transformations as the robot is moving. That's the localization problem. Now, just like rotation groups, we have another group. This, is, this, this group is called a special Euclidean group. It consists of a translation, which is a 3D translation vector, and a rotation matrix. And when it acts on R3, you get <coughs> rotation times your point plus a translation. So it first rotates the vector, and then it adds the translation. Now, we're a little, a little lazy to remember this like this and track it, so we're going to invent something new. So let's create a new set of coordinates, 
call it homogeneous representation. Instead of for every vector, this is not a quaternion, just I used Q before. This is just a point, right? For every point, instead of R3, let's make it four-dimensional and add, add one to the end, right? So for every point in 3D space, add one. We'll make it a four vector. Now if you take a delta of, let's say, Q2 minus Q1, this will give you a vector, right? Displacement vector that the bottom part will be zero. And that's okay, right? Because it's a vector, but this is a point. So for points, we have this one. If you take the delta, then it's, you get zero in the, in the bottom. This is the homogeneous coordinates. Now the rules are that sum of sums and differences of vectors are vectors because you have zeros in the bottom. The sum of a vector and a point is a point because the vector is just translating the point. And that's okay. You get one plus zero, right? A vector is a carrier. It moves one point to another point. That's what it's supposed to do. The difference between two points, take the delta, that's the vector. It shows the displacement from one point to another. You cannot add two points. It doesn't have any meaning because then you get one plus one in the bottom row and that's just not defined, right? So to move a, vec to move a point, you need a vector, not, not another point. A point is just a fixed object. So that, these are the rules, not very difficult to use in practice. Now the advantage of this definition is that now we can arrange this affine transformation into a matrix that is now four by four. This bottom row is zero, 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 and one. So R is three by three, right? And P is three by one. Now when we multiply this by a point, that Q we had, right? You will get R, Q plus P, and one. So you don't need to remember. When, when we use the matrix form, it will follow directly from the way we arrange them. And that's one advantage of using these matrices. So that's why we make the homogeneous uh, coordinates. It's very convenient. When you multiply, what happens? You multiply two rigid body transformations. You get a sequence of rotations, right? We first rotate the second vector, right? Second point to align it with the first frame and then we add the translation of the first frame. Now this is all happening automatically. It's all automated. You have these numerical matrices, you multiply them in a the computer, it tracks it's everything for you. You do not need to track them manually. But the meaning behind it is that. So it, it handles the, this orientation and translation order automatically for you. And just a reminder that H2 times H1 is not the same as H1 times H2. You can multiply and you see that you will get different results. How do you, now the inverse of the rotation was the transpose. What about this one? Because I have good intuition, I make a guess and I'm gonna tell you this is the inverse. How do you prove it? Well, multiply them. If you get the identity, that's the answer because the inverse is unique, right? If it exists, it is unique. Basically multiply these two matrices. If we get identity, well, that is the correct answer. You can try this if you're feeling lucky in exam. You can guess an answer. <laughs> but try it um, at your own expense. 
You will not get extra grade because you guessed. So one thing we want to do that you typically don't see it in a course on kinematics or dynamics and robotics, they do cover some of the topics we talked about. But in the context of mobile robotics, we want to also model probabilities and uncertainty using rigid body motion. And that's an important topic for us because later we want to do a state estimation over a rigid body, rotation and translation. So basically that dominates, this rigid body motion dominates the topic of uh, point cloud registration, localization, slam, because our movements are always a rigid body motion, okay? Now, one thing we will learn is that these matrix groups, like rotation and rigid body transformation, they come with a built-in coordinate system. And that's very nice. They give you an intrinsic coordinate system attached to the body frame. It is called exponential coordinates. It is similar to that angle that was in the exponential of the Euler formula, but it's gen it is generalized to higher dimensions. Now, for a lot of problem that involves rotation and translation, you get a distribution that when you do Monte Carlo propagation, you get a distribution that looks like a banana. It is nonlinear, similar to that polar coordinates example, right? Now we understand that when you model them in the exponential coordinates, they are linear and Gaussian. So that covers a fair portion of problems that we thought they are nonlinear. They are uh, basically linear exponential. So in the exponential coordinate, they are, they are linear, not that directly they are linear, right? So that means using an exponential map, you can go to that space that we were adding the angles, right? Do all the work you want in that nice vector space that looks like usual um, Euclidean space that we work on. And then you can come back to the Nonlinear space where this rotation and transformations are. And that's what you get because you can model, for example, this flat Gaussian in the exponential coordinate, and then you can map it back to the nonlinear map, the nonlinear covariance. Okay? A covariance matrix can't be bent like this because matrix is linear. It is through this exponentiation that we can go back and forth between this nonlinearity and a linear exponential model. And that's Lie algebra. So you have example codes here, but this is just to motivate. There's much more into these groups. So next time we talk about Lie groups, as I said, they are the best tools we have to study um, these objects and symmetries of continuous symmetries of spaces, and they come with the coordinates that we will use for solving a lot of problems in this course. You can take a look at the codes to generate these plots for curved covariance propagation. Some of the topics uh, that I covered, you can read them in chapter six. This is also a very nice book that uses Lie groups for kinematics and dynamics. So that's it for today.